Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Semper Milan podcast. I'm your host, Ollie Fisher, joined once again by Anthony Targrud. Listen, guys, the commitment I've shown today <laughs> takes real next level commitment because it is 608, and my God, do I wish I was asleep. Madison decided he wasn't going to wake up, and uh, I was really close to doing the same. So, oh, he woke here. up. He woke up to let us know that he wasn't going to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah. You know, is what it is. So drop some Maddie here in the comments. Don't actually do that. Um, he's, he's, uh, his little boy is sick at the moment. So uh, norovirus, I believe. Not that it's important, but um, I imagine that can be... <laughs> I don't mean it like that. I just mean I can... I imagine that can be pretty rough, uh, you know, because he is very young and also... Uh, his wife has come down with it as well. So get well soon to the entire Derry and Toth family. Um, and yeah, we're going to proceed uh, as the as the troublesome twosome. Um, episode 301, we're into a new century. I suppose technically last week we were into a new century, but um, but here we go. It's just been us for both of them. So. It has, yeah, yeah. Just like the good old days, eh? Um, before we dive into this week's episode, obviously... We've actually only got one game to talk about, which is not for another six days. So um, this is the international break for you. It's the last one before the end of the season. So from here on out, it's going to be pretty hectic. But um, thank you to our Substat founding members, Des Windsor, McGlynn, Ali Tareen, Tito, Matt Moritz, Pullman, Joey Gawler, Kemin, MJ, Mats, Luke Villano, Raul Escobar, Rajat and Carlo Fassi. Really appreciate uh, all of your support as always. Um and as a reminder to those of you who haven't checked out the Substack already, um, go and have a look. You can see some article previews. Uh, you can try a week for free. And um, there might be some stuff there that you like. For example, in the last week, we have had um, Isaac done an article about uh, the impact of Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Milan's globalization in terms of revenues. <laughs> the newsletter was centered around the decision to play the derby against Inter on a Monday night for the first time ever. That that means that um, the the derby will have been played on every single day of the week. So that's something. The bonus podcast was a fantasy football challenge that you and Isaac did due to lack of any other availability. Isaac stepped up to the plate. And the concept behind that was that you were both uh, picking uh, an 11, a functional 11, and you were only allowed to pick one player from each Serie A club as a maximum. So that was very interesting. Um, and you both did a fantastic job with that, I must say. I'm giving the edge to your team, to be honest. But, hey, all right. uh, that's for another thing. Um, and yeah, most recently, this was in the last 24 hours, Isaac also did a bit of a deep dive on the younger players, both Primavera and some that are out on loan that are at a crossroads heading into the summer. So you've got the likes of Colombo, Maldini, Giancarlo Simic, and some of uh, the names that have been touted as potentials for the under-23 team. Shall we start with the preview then? Oh yeah, let's do that. It's uh, I yeah. believe Fiorentina. Hopefully, correct me if I'm wrong. It is Fiorentina. Cool, it is cool. Fiorentina. Um, this is quite a tough one to come back from the break. I think. Um, I don't have anything else other than that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, F- Fiorentina has been a bit of a a bit of a difficult place to go for us. Like we even lost there in the Scudetto season, four three. Um, it feels like the place where we've been before and, and seasons have kind of derailed. Um, but yeah, they're currently in eighth place on 43 points. They've won 12 of their 28 games, drawn seven, lost nine. Um, they've scored 41, let in 32. They are currently uh, eight points off Roma in who are in fifth place, but they've got a game in hand to play. So they're not they're not fully out of the Champions League picture yet, especially if that fifth place does end up getting a UCL spot. But it's been typical Fiorentina, really. Like they've they've flirted with it, they've had good runs, and then they've just had a couple of bad results that set them back and and um mean that they're probably gonna miss out on the Champions League uh for another season. Um yeah, I would say that their chances are pretty slim. Looking yeah. at the table now, I mean they're they're eight points off of fifth if that is the spot for Champions League. So I would probably count them out of Europe in general, to be honest. I think Napoli's finally getting their shit together. Atalanta's a, a solid team right now, so I, I don't see Fiorentina jumping up. Um, that doesn't mean they can't beat us this game, you know? I mean, the yeah. last time out in the season, 
Uh, it, it took us a Taylor Hernandez penalty to win, and Taylor Hernandez is suspended, so um, mm. we won't have him. <laughs> and uh, I, Musa and Pulisic won uh, Nations League for the third consecutive time last night, but um, Pulisic posted pictures on Instagram around midnight last night, and he was uh, drinking brews, and you know they were they were in the locker room so. after lifting a trophy, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully he recovers in time. I mean, he's a young kid. He's not like me anymore, so I'm sure he'll be fine by, by Saturday, but yeah. Well, he'll you know be... what Americans are like? They're not generally very alcohol tolerant. Well, uh, <laughs> who was it? Tyler Adams was drinking a Truly, so oh, that tells you everything you need to know. And Christian's with uh, Nick Ultra, so it's already like 60 calories or whatever it is. You know? That's it as well, isn't it? Like, you've no more games during the break. So, yeah, that's you know, idea. like the, the European... Um, what was I going to say? The, the friendlies in Europe. There's a few today. There's even a couple tomorrow, I think, as well. So I, I think it'll end up being around about similar when they get back into training. Yeah. And obviously playing on Saturday night as opposed to Sunday is a little bit of a drawback. I said six days. It's actually five until we play them. But should still be fine. Um, and We all came back uh, early, though. So, you know, he's he did. Yeah. Ready. Yeah. Um, and then it's kind of worked the other way with the French lads. So Manian obviously took a little bit of a, uh, well, it was like a little muscle strain or something during the Verona game when he made that save with the splits. And he missed their uh, defeat against Germany at home, but he's expected to start tonight, as is Teo and as is Giroud. So that's kind of worked the other way around where you'd probably mm. want them to play the first game and be rested for the second. But that's the way it is. And also, uh, Turam got booed off <laughs> and the, the France crowd were calling for Giroud. So wow. we can... That's 5-2 in the derby now. Um, also, something that I'd, I had forgotten, shouldn't have forgotten, but had forgotten, is that the reason that Fiorentina have played one less game um, is, of course, because they were expected to play Atalanta last weekend and the game was postponed because Joe Barone was taken ill, who was there. Um, he, he was an executive uh, at Fiorentina. He had a heart attack, and it turns out that, obviously, he, he unfortunately passed away. So condolences to to his family and to everyone connected with Fiorentina. So it means it'll be the first game since that's happened. No doubt there'll be a minute's silence, maybe applause or or whatever. There'll be something to commemorate him. So it'll be an emotionally charged game, uh, without a doubt. Um, and I'm just looking at the games before that. Fiorentina drew 2-2 with Roma. That was a really good game, actually. Enjoyed that one. Uh, before that, drew with Fiorentina. Then they, they beat Lazio prior to that. Their most recent defeat was 14th of Feb against Bologna um, and before that they also lost to Inter so I think that kind of shows where they're at they're able mm -hmm. to compete against the teams around them and below them but when it comes to to getting one over on a team ahead of them um, that's where they fall short uh, team what are you doing how, how are we replacing Teo is it as simple as Florenzi slotting in at left back I think that's our only option right I mean I genuinely don't think we own another left back so yeah it's, it's probably going to be Florenzi over there Teo Chano can play there but I'm not sure that this is the game for that, to be honest. Yeah, I'd rather not see um, him. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, we were so close to zero injuries, and now I'm looking at the thing, and Benacer's out, Glue's out, Pobega's still out, Mignon doubtful, it says. So, interesting. Um, I mean, it, it's going to be Tamori and Chow, right? We know that. It's going to be Calabria. Um, I would assume Florenzi has left. And then I would imagine everything else is the same. You might start Chukweze this game just to give Pulisic that extra bit of rest, but I, I don't know. It's Pioli, so he probably won't. Um, and I don't know who starts up top. It's most likely going to be Giroud, but yeah, I, I wouldn't mind letting Okafor continue his run. You know, he didn't get called up. Where did he get called up? Okafor did. He yeah. did. Okay. And he played I as a number nine for, for Switzerland. Yeah, they they actually played against Denmark, so Kier mm. was marking Okafor, mm. and Kier came off after 65 minutes with a muscle problem. Uh, we are going to do a little international roundup, so we'll we'll talk about what's happened, um, but Benacer is expected to actually be okay. So, mm. um, okay, I, I, I would... And another thing to factor in is that we're not straight back into European action, so playing three games every eight days, we've actually got a week off, and then we play Lecce at home in the game mm. after this, so I almost think you can afford to play 
your strong strongest possible eleven, regardless of if any comeback with fatigue. You try to get the job done in 60, 70 minutes, whatever, and then make changes if you need to. But also the players are going to get what two or three days rest after this. So mm. you gotta go. We've got to go for it. We've got to try and hang on to second. Yeah. Um, because we've got an into Juve back to back coming up. Um well and you and... may play uh someone this week. I mean, obviously, but... Do you know what? They've had a pretty tough run of games, really. I mean, obviously, they've completely pissed the bed when it comes to second, because I think it was six weeks ago, it was a seven-point gap between us and them. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a... Th so it's been a ten-point swing, because we're three ahead yeah. of them. Um, yeah. They've got seven they points Lazio. in the last eight. Yeah, so... Right after Sorry yep. left, so maybe. Who knows? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just looking here at Fiorentina's team as well. Um... So they have got Terracciano in goal, but Pietro and no, there is good no one. relation. Yeah. <laughs> your your agenda against him is yeah. yeah, take it to the grave, man. <laughs> uh Coyote at right back, he's really good. Now, if the rumors are true and we are kind of looking at potentially upgrading that position, bringing someone in to challenge Calabria, letting Florenzi go, using Terracciano as a, whatever, like as a midfielder, Jimenez seen more as a left back. Um then Coyote is someone that I'd like for us to go for. Like he's he's been really really good this season. Nikola Milenkovic is still there at centre back, which is quite funny. It feels like he's been linked to a big club every single summer and never went. Um, Ranieri uh, uh, is the other centre back, or at least this was in the Roma game. Biragi was left back. Maxime Lopez and Mandragora, the defensive midfielders. Nico Gonzalez is, in my opinion, their their best player mm. and. He's the right winger, and we don't have a proper left back, so that could be problematic. But hopefully, tomorrow on the left side, that defense can do a job on him. Bonaventura has been playing as the attacking midfielder, of course, could be attack of the X. Uh, Sotil on the left, and they've been playing Bellotti up front. Interesting. Who's a striker so sure. pre January? Uh, Arthur Cabral, I want to say. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I. I'm going to look. Um, but I, I had sort of forgotten that Bellotti had gone there, to be honest. So did I. Um, I'll be honest. Yeah. I haven't watched a single game from them um, this season outside of, you know, the, the reverse of this fixture. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Arthur Cabral is actually at Benfica. So ignore me there. What I, who I meant was the guy that they signed from River Plate, Beltran. We were linked with him just as we were oh, linked okay. with Cabral, Lucas Beltran. Um, so yeah, I guess they've been alternating him in and out. Um, it looks like they've also been messing around with the midfield a bit. They've also got Fabiano Parisi, who mm. seems to be starting on the bench at left back. Like that, that seemed like a good signing for them at the time. He'd been doing really well at Empoli, and he just can't get into the starting lineup. Uh, Yeri Mina, who you might remember. Yeah. Um, is there Joseph Breccolo, who I thought was good last season as well? Um, so they've got options, Fiorentina, and obviously they're well coached. Italiano sets them up well, generally. Um, and there's been a lot of links with him getting a job like the Napoli job come the summer, uh, maybe Roma if they decide to go in a different direction, if De Rossi don't want it full time or whatever. So, yeah, there's plenty to go out there. Prediction 2 1 for Milan. Um, I don't know who's going to score. I just don't want to say we're going to lose. I think we're in a hot, hot, hot streak right now, and it'll continue. You know, if if okay after Joe Barone, I wouldn't be surprised if Fiorentina play the game of their lives, and and rightly so. I hope they do. Mm -hmm. I just hope we're still better. Yeah, fall three, but in our favor this time. That'd be nice. nice too. Um. So yeah, just looking back at the at the most recent results. Obviously, as you said, we beat them one nil earlier in the season. Teo Hernandez penalty. We lost two one there last season. Um, the goals were scored by Nico Gonzalez and Luka Jovic, mm. uh, who will return to face his former club. That's something not to be underestimated, I suppose, in all of this. Um, having they, We beat them 2-1 at home in the reverse fixture that season. Uh, we lost 4-3 away in the Scudetto season. Um, the last time we won there was 2020-21 season. We, we were 3-2 winners. I'm uh, just trying to jog my memory there. Oh, yeah. Ibra, Brahim, and Chalanoglu. That's where we came from 2 1 down. Ribery had scored for them. Uh, that was a really good game. There seemed to be some thrillers that happen at the Frankie. Um, but yeah, our, our record away from home there is a bit mixed, to say the least. I'm going to say a 2 2 draw and a really good game. 
I feel this is typical of one of the fixtures that we drop points in. You know, uh, I'm a bit worried about us defensively, especially with Noteo and uh, Chiao has been a bit rusty since he came back, but there's no Kalulu to put in because mm-hmm. he's out four or six weeks and Kier has come off injured in the international break. Maybe you play Tamori Gabia, so you've got two players you know are well rested and they remained at home over the break. I, I potentially be tempted to do that um and then i think yeah the rest of the team pretty much picks itself but i'm gonna go 2-2 in a really good game and uh we gotta hope that juve drop points as well and preferably into but i don't think that's happening um yeah so for a good one and a win let's hope i'm wrong uh let's move on internationals i've got a little graphic here which I'm going to refer to because it's almost impossible to go up and down everybody's list. So this was accurate as of before the USA game last night. Hmm. So you can you can update this. Um, how did Pulisic play the full ninety? No, he played damn near it though. He I think he got something right. like the eighty seventh or something like that, and he played okay. the full one twenty the game before. Yes, that's what I've got here. And Musa played sixty three minutes of the first game, uh, and he didn't start last night. Is that right? Yeah, he came on around 70 minutes or so. Okay. Uh, neither of them got a goal or an assist, I'm presuming. I, I heard that Pulisic forced one of Jamaica's own goals. I don't, I don't know what that means, though. No. Nah. He took the... It was a corner kick. He took the corner. Right. And then, so, I mean, he assisted the own goal, kind of. Um, and yeah. kind of similar happened with uh, Gio Reyna's goal. Pulisic either took a shot or made a pass and it deflected off of someone else to him or some shot. I don't know. He was involved in the buildup, but he didn't get any like actual credit to the goals, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at it now, Pulisic came off in the 93rd minute. So, oh, right. Yeah. 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 So basically um, thing. Yes. And a special mention to Tijani Reinders, who got his first goal for the Netherlands. Uh, and it was an absolute screamer against Scotland. They battered them. Um, it was sort of similar to the goal that he scored against Slavia. They got ball on the edge of the box and hit it near post. That one went along the ground. This one went in the top corner. It was a beauty. And he got an assist for the final goal, the, the fourth goal for the Netherlands. So well done to him. Jovic is back starting for Serbia, which is crazy to me. Um, but good on him because he seemed to be out of the plans given some of the options they've got there. Um, Vlahovic, obviously, Mitrovic, and uh, yeah, he played 73 minutes, didn't get a goal or an assist for them. Kier, as mentioned, came off with about uh, 25 to go, but it sounds like he's okay. He's remained with Denmark and he's in line to potentially start tomorrow night. I'd rather he didn't, but here we are. Okafor played 65 minutes for Switzerland as a centre forward. He didn't get a goal or an assist, but he was apparently one of their better players, um, and it was a nil nil draw, so you know, go figure. Uh, Leal played. Just uh, 46 minutes for Portugal as they murdered Isaac Sweden, 5-2. Uh, some first game for their head coach and former Milan striker John Dal Thomason, who I actually really like. But that was a cool game uh, in terms of the goals that were scored. There were some absolute screamers in there. And Liao's was one of them. Uh, picked up the ball after a bit of a, a blot shot inside the box. And he, he postage stamped it, top corner, lovely finish. The sort of goal that we've been saying that we need to see more of from him. And uh, yeah, he was brought off after basically the first half and Martinez has sent home him and several other Portugal's top players. I think basically he's saying he's seen enough of them and he wants to give the second friendly to the players who are fighting for a spot in the squad, which I think is a really good way uh, to manage things, to be honest. And glad he only had 45 minutes. Um, yeah, something else. Go on. Sorry. Oh no! I was. You mentioned a couple screamers in there. Um, if you haven't watched it, it's not a Milan player goal. But if you haven't seen the Tyler Adams goal from last night, go watch that. Genuinely, one of the best goals I've ever seen. It was so deep, and it it reminded me of um, that Stadorf goal in the 10-11 oh, yeah. season against I want to say Verona, where it's just a fucking rocket and it doesn't rise, it doesn't drop. It's just a straight bullet. Laser beam. Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. Um, but that was. All I had to add. I mean, I didn't watch any games besides that one last night. So, just having a look at it here. Oh wow, that is yeah. a great goal. Yeah, yeah. came yeah. out of nowhere. I actually jumped from the parking lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the tweet says, "Yeah." Um, another thing from from the Portugal Sweden game, which was interesting and has been picked up on, 
One of the strikers that Milan have been linked with quite heavily in the last week or so is Victor Jokerez, who was at Sporting uh, Lisbon. He's one of the names that I actually threw out there a while ago. Well, I guess it would have been last season when he was at Coventry. Now, obviously not like a Milan should sign a Coventry striker to be the starting number nine in the future because that's quite a tough one, but just like want to keep an eye on. And of course, he's gone there and he's got 39 goals in 36 games. You know, he's, he's stepped up in a big way. After the game... Liao and Giocarez exchanged shirts. Mm. Uh, they exchanged follows on social media. And uh, it's it's there's a bit of a frenzy that's that's developed around it. Now, you can't read too much into it. I think he's going to go for a very, very big sum to the Premier League this summer. But with that, and with Ibrahimovic being his idol, you just wonder if we might be moving some pieces around to uh, to try and have a genuine a genuine attempt at signing Giocarez, who now I would say is like one of the best options that we have been linked with. Mm -hmm. um, then you got Teo and Giroud, who price will be about, well, so he's got a 100 mil release clause, which is obviously way too high, but you know what Portuguese clubs are like, probably yeah. be a negotiation in there. Gazetta this morning said 50. I, I don't think mm. so. I think it's more 70, oh, 80, okay. well. which is too high for us on yeah. a single player anyway. Um but who knows? You know, two year loan at thirty five mil with option to buy turned to <laughs> obligation at thirty. <laughs> if we win the quadruple, yeah, um, yeah uh, Teo and Giroud came on for the last half an hour as France got beat two nil at home by Germany. Now that was deemed as a bit of a shock result. Like the the France fans were booing, they were unhappy and stuff like that. And it was at the same time as I was at Wembley watching England lose one nil to Brazil. And it's like <laughs> just this huge overreaction for friendlies. It's like, no, yeah. I don't think they're that bothered, really. <laughs> you know, I, I, does it mean that France are not pre Euros favourites because they lost a friendly at home against Germany? In my opinion, no. Um, but as I say, it was quite funny to see the fans chanting for Giroud and get getting to Ram off, who got a three out of ten in Le Keep's player ratings. So, Jeez. you know, yeah, and Manian uh, did not play. Oh, that's um, good. So... Avoided any drama there. Yeah. Um. Maybe England should have called up uh Tamori and and good old cheeks. Could have done should something. have done. Should yeah. have done. I, I. I mean, like, I know why he doesn't call up Tamori. It's because Tamori is not a defender who is, who is who excels in in the way that he plays, which is a deep line. And it's tournament football in that sense. Like, mm -hmm. if you go into a game against France, who we'd probably have to beat, we beat England, uh, who we'd probably have to beat in the, I think it's the quarters or the semi-finals of the Euros, and you play a high line, and it's Tamori Stones or whatever, I, I, it's, it's bold. It's really bold. International football, you just don't tend to see that. The games are a mm -hmm. lot more cagey. That's why you like Stones and Maguire, because when balls come in, they tend to... Like, Maguire generally hasn't been an awful performer for England. It's just for United, when he's playing so far up with Ten Hag, mm -hmm. that his weaknesses get exposed. With Tamori, I think if you sit him further back and, and you ask him to be perfect positionally and stuff like that, that just isn't what he's used to playing at the moment. Right. However, he should be in there. You know, I do think he should be in there, even if it's just to be in and around the squad, getting that experience... Um, he's called up Jared Branthwaite, who's been having a good season for Everton. And I'm just thinking, is it, has he not called up Tamari because he made what one or two starts since his injury and he didn't want to, you know, throw him in there with the extra workload? Maybe there that was an agreement sense. with Milan. But as for Loftus Cheek, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. While he keeps picking his fucking favorite Henderson and, um, yeah, he was never even mentioned, but The Athletic did an article, it was James Horncastle's piece, basically saying that it's wrong that Loftus-Cheek has been overlooked and that Southgate should have called him up, um, especially given that England are a bit short on midfielders. But, you know, he's 20, 27 years of age now. Um, this is the best stretch of form that he's put together in his career. And uh, if it's not going to happen now, you sort of wonder, is it is it going to happen? And the answer is yeah. probably no. Yeah, they posted a Milan posted a video of Lapis Cheek and uh, Lapo Nava, I think it was, uh -huh. um, playing basketball in the training center. And yeah. Lapis Cheek had a decent shot, but my God, is it so funny to watch like people who just aren't raised in a nation that basketball is a relevant sport shoot a basketball? Mm. <laughs> I mean, like. <laughs> 
<laughs> it, yeah. it was just crazy because as an American, you know, throwing a football and, and shooting a basketball, you're just going to know how to do. I can't kick a soccer ball to save my life. So don't get me wrong. Like, I get it. You know, Europeans obviously got us beat there. But, yeah, that shit is funny. <laughs> yeah. That's all. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 that's a very solid observation. Um, I'm surprised, like, basketball, it's, it's not a big, big sport in Italy. But, like, they do at least care a bit about it. Mm-hmm. But I just think, you know, they're not a brilliant national team, are they? Or anything like that. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I know Milan, I think it's still like Emporio Armani, mm. Olympia Milano is the team something or something like that. Like that. And Virtus Bologna have a pretty good team, at least when it comes to the European competitions. But, yeah, maybe Lapo should be yeah. sticking to... I mean, he's a keeper. He should be good with his hands, no? You think, right? <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I'm fully aware that, like, Four out of the top five NBA players right now are from Europe, so don't don't fucking come at me in the comments. It, it wasn't this yeah. blanket diss towards Europeans. It was just an observation about one. It's okay. You're a trash. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> yeah. Um. What else? Oh yeah. The other talking point. This came out late last night. Um. It it was oh was it Sky? I think it was Sky. Yeah. Who said Alex mm. Jimenez is staying? Uh, we are going to make him a permanent signing, and it's going to be less than the five mil euros that we agreed in the buyout originally with Real Madrid. And Real Madrid's buyback is going to remain, but it's going to be at a higher figure than was originally agreed. So two big positives there, I think. Yeah. I think that's wise business to get done ahead of the summer. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that just reminded me, maybe he'll play left back against Fiorentina. <laughs> I completely Maybe. forgot about him. Um, yeah, yeah every, all but one time that he's played, he's looked really sharp. Um, what was that time where he just... Was it a Champions League game that he played? Um, no, it wasn't a Champions League game. He played in the Cup, and he, he played in uh, the league a little bit. That's it. I think it was the Cup where he got completely shut down. Because his first league appearance, I thought he looked really good. And then he got a start, and he, he looked awful. We lost that game, so it probably was the Cup. Um, but overall, I mean, he's a very promising young player, and I, I think he's got a bright future if he could uh, keep his head on straight and and stay healthy and you know get the work. I think he could do something. Yeah, he's only eighteen, and and when he arrived, I remember there being a little bit of surprise among the Spanish media that they'd let him go because he was one of those players who was, I guess, it'd be sort of like us letting um Simic go or something like that mm. like he's one of those players who was always deemed to be on the fringes and was going to make the Real Madrid first team at some point like he was he was captain I think of of some of the youth teams there and then there was a little bit about his attitude but the feeling was that you know he, he was still going to come through and they just decided to let him go so there was a bit of surprise about that and I'm not surprised uh in turn that we've managed to you know hopefully get get the best out of him to this point and that he's going to be staying beyond the end of the season, which is good news. He's only 18. There's plenty of room for growth. Fullback is a position where I think we're going to need some reinforcements in, in the windows to come. So this could definitely be one of them. And I always thinking ahead to the under 23 team as well. People like him and Simic and Zeroli and Kamada and Liberali, Quentin like all those players are perfect candidates. If we do manage to get the under 23 team registered for next season, so um, we're building something pretty exciting, I would say, in in terms of the youth talents that we've got. And uh, he will add another piece to that. Let's do some questions. Ooh. Gregory Peck. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a mix of the ones that were replied to for this week and, and some from last week as well. Um, Gregory Peck says, we are 10 points better off compared to last season. We invested in the summer. The players seem to enjoy playing for Pioli. If we finish second in the league and get to the Europa League final, I'm leaning towards keeping Pioli for another season. Am I being crazy? Um, I didn't realize that we were 10 points better than last season because mm-hmm. I keep seeing the comparison to the Scudetto season, which has us like one off. So that's been in my head. But yeah, there's there's a whole other season in between those two. Um, no, I don't actually think you're crazy. I had a very similar thought yesterday. Um, I don't know why. And I, I quickly, you know, took it out of my brain. But yeah, like, look, if he pulls off second and we do win the Europa League, it's going to be hard to, to let him go. You know, he he will have performed at a better rate than he did in, in the Scudetto season, if that's the case. I mean, if we keep this pace up, 
winning and, and finishing on the same amount of points, then Scudetto season, while we may not win it this year, still be replicating that success. The summer signings are accounting for 40 goals and assists this season alone, which is insane compared to last season where they contributed to five. Um, and then if you win a trophy on top of that, like it, it is hard to, to say goodbye after that. So no, I don't think it's crazy. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, I think a lot of fans are thinking along the same path now where like, if we, cause as you said, we're, we're a point off the Scudetto winning pace. Now that was a, I think that was a relatively low, uh, season in terms of the total needed to win the league whereas this season obviously you've got into traveling at a ridiculous pace unfortunately um it was it's very tough for anyone to match that um that being said it doesn't mind it doesn't mean that you shouldn't aspire to at least compete in the derby and you sh- we shouldn't be closer to them should be more consistent that all applies but yeah you know the, the new signings have been integrated well they've got they've contributed to nearly 75 percent of the goals that we've scored this season which is mad because you start thinking then what are they going to be like next season you know when they've uh when they've when they've had a full season in syria um yeah i always think that that especially with this era that we're in now where the league title win kind of shifted the goalposts a little bit we we should be aiming to win a trophy a season and yes the europa league will be tough because there's liverpool and leverkusen that stand in the way and other difficult sides but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have won the Coppa Italia, for example, where you you give yourself a bit more leeway and a bit more leverage. Um, so we're in this position now where we we have to win that to salvage the season. And if we don't, then I think it's going to be judged fairly negatively. And I I think that I think that the the difficulty comes in um, sort of the continuity versus time for a change argument, you know, because. Having having the same head coach for what would be heading into a fifth full season would have its advantages without a doubt. But this summer, more so than most others, there are going to be some really good managers available. So what if you decide to stick with Purely for one more season, get to the end of his contract um, so you don't have to pay him out, basically, and uh, the, the same crop of managers are not available next season? You know, then you'd say we missed the boat a little bit with that. So I think a lot depends. Obviously, this is a cop out answer, but so much depends on what happens between now and the end of the season. Are we able to win a trophy? Do the injury problems come back? How do we get on in that next derby against Inter? I think those are the things that will weigh the most heavily. And also with Ibra coming in as like a senior advisor, as much as he respects and I think I think he likes purely on a personal level. Like they, mm-hmm. they've got a very close bond, but. He knows more than anyone that business is business, and you know if the time comes to change, then it will happen. Um, but yeah. yeah, really, really interesting couple of months away. Um, moving on, Casey Cordre asks: With Giroud moving on next season, who on our team can help fill that void? Who's a realistic option to buy for next year, knowing that the club usually don't spend more than 40, 50 mil? How should the so yeah we'll we'll elaborate on that a little bit and say in in an ideal world who are our three number nines heading into next season you know the starter the backup and the reserve yeah um I th- I think we keep Jovic and I think we keep um, Okafor mm-hmm. um I think realistically if we go for a big name it's Xerxes do I think we're gonna get that done I kind of doubt it. And maybe that's just pessimism from the last however many seasons of saying we're going to get a top striker and then and then not. Um, yeah. So I don't know who we'll end up getting. It'll probably be someone that we're not 100% thrilled about. Or it's just Okafor is the guy and we we promote Kamarda. You know, like I, I could see it being something silly like that too, where we don't sign any actual new player and it's just uh, we move everyone up one rung, you know, which mm-hmm. I don't want to say is worst case scenario because I do believe in Okafor. I think he's capable of you know, leading, leading the line in this team. Um, but it, it's going to take time for him to get there. He's just, he just hasn't done it enough yet to, to really be able to produce. I mean, obviously he's contributing off the bench and he looks lively every single time. And him as a striker between Leo and Pulisic is a lot more fluid, a lot faster, mm. a lot more dynamic um, things add up. But at the end of the day, Giroud is the guy getting the goals, getting the assist. So it'll be tough to replace him. Yeah, I, I really think that we should we should 
try convince Giroud to stay for another season. For as much as I've bemoaned him, I think if we can convince him to do another year, I mean, he's got 14 goals this season. If we can convince him to do another year, but tell him that he's going to be, you know, he's going to have his minutes managed. And then Jovic can be, Jovic and Okafor can basically fight to be the third mm -hmm. choice. Then I think yeah. we're deep in that position. And we know that we're signing a player regardless. But just having Giroud there with his 14 goals, having Jovic there with his eight, and uh, Okafor, who's contributed, you know, really well in terms of minutes per goal, I just think that gives you a bit of a, a blanket that means that the new striker doesn't have to come in with a 20 plus goal season. Whereas if Giroud goes and all of a sudden Jovic is your backup, who we know can't really, he doesn't do the same when he starts games. Okafor's produced most of his um, his goals off the bench as well. I just think it would remove the pressure a little bit. But for Giroud, it's sort of one of those where you can't force him to stay. Like he, he's he's given us a lot, and if he yeah. wants to move to to uh, to the MLS, you know, for his family and to potentially transition into a director role once he's hung up his boots, then you can't stand in his way. You've got to say thank you and, and good luck yeah. with that. Then we might look at signing two strikers. I don't know. Um, there was talk of Jorge Mendes offering us um, Goncalo Ramos on loan from PSG and then us signing another, you know, actually investing in a forward as well. If we were to go into next season with, for example, um, Sesko, Ramos, Jovic as our three and then Okafor, fighting for that third spot that was really good to me i'd certainly yeah. be quite happy with that but you know salary i don't know if that'll be the case like i don't know if they'll get rid of ramos if mbappe is really leaving mm. they're gonna have to spend big on a striker of course that's what they'll do it's psg but colin Mouane is the guy in he? you know i i think that they really believe in him for the future um but that that as you say with mbappe going ramos is gonna be the backup you know, yeah. So I don't know. It'll be interesting, but um, we'll definitely have someone new in the striking department next season. But yeah, we will. Yeah, um, we can't put it off anymore. It's as simple as that. We we have got to, um, we have got to to make that investment in a uh, in a top centre forward, and who it will be, I don't know. But as a follow up question to this, four inches, Jimmy. I mean, I, I don't know how the name came about, but I can guess. Rank the following. Uh, in terms of the best deal brackets, the price for the player. So you got Jonathan David for 30 mil, Xerxy for 45, Sesco for 55, Jokerez for 70. So best deal and best player are obviously different things. That yeah, becomes they are. difficult. Um, best deal, I'd probably go Xerxes at one. David at two, if he's at that 30 mil, um, then Sesco, then Jokerez. But I would say skill-wise, it would probably be Sesco, Jokerez, Xerxes, David. Yeah, the David thing's interesting because like, we'd all written him off as a, as a target, um, even knowing that we'd probably be able to get him on a more advantageous deal than the others, given that he's got just over a year left on his deal. But he has kind of exploded again in 2024, and he's scoring a goal a game, and um, he's looking pretty good again. But, you know, I, I've seen some some people who watch Liga saying he's back to playing off someone, you know, rather than being isolated up front. So maybe that's helped him a bit. Obviously, he takes pens. Um, but it would be interesting to see if those rumours resurface a little bit. Um, obviously, Jokeres is the main one at the moment, but the, the, the media outlets just seem to be alternating. It's like a merry-go-round, like who's going to be in focus. Matteo Moretto, who's obviously re very reliable, said last night that he he doesn't consider Sesco to be a target for us and that Xerxes is the number one priority. I think Xerxes at, at 45 there is the deal to be had because mm -hmm. I think he's got the potential to grow to a lot more than that. There's more to his game than just finishing as well, like maybe a couple of the others on the list. Um, he gets so involved in the build-up and... People say, yeah, he's not a 20-goal scorer. We don't know that for a start. He's only 22 years old. He could develop into one. He knows Serie A well. But also, I'm just thinking of the wingers. Like, it, we could get into a position genuinely where we've got wingers giving us 45, 50 goals a season. You know, if Liao can get to 15, Pulisic can get to 15, kick on next season, uh, we can get Chuck and Okafor into some form playing out there, then... You know, it all of a sudden, it doesn't really matter how many goals your striker's giving you, but Xerxes is probably going to give you 15, 20. Uh, and, and who knows? Like, 
Jokerez is 25. He's a late bloomer, really. Mm -hmm. um, more, the most natural centre forward on that list by a mile is Jokerez, but this is his first season in the top league. And yeah, he's banging them in, but I've seen, also seen people saying, well, what about Piontek and you know these others? And you can like massively overpay for someone who's, mm -hmm. who's just found the right place at that right moment. Uh Tough man. I still think I still think it could be somebody that's not not been mentioned. You know, I, I don't know who, but yeah, like Jimenez keeps being mentioned in the background. I really like him. Um, oh, he didn't look good yeah. last night. He didn't Shit. even start. Who starts for him up front? Uh, it's normally him, but it wasn't. It was. Um, I don't know how many of them there are. So let me see. Uh, line up. It was some Henry Martin, a 31 year old oh, from yeah. Club America. Yeah, but, he plays in yeah. Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, Jimenez came on in the 65th enough. minute, immediately got a yellow card, and didn't do yeah. anything. Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. Well, there's also some options in Syria that are, that are kind of interesting. Um, Lorenzo, I mean, look, Take this with a pinch of salt. I'm just saying, if we chose to go the domestic route, Lorenzo Lucas having a really good season with um, Udinese, and we were linked with him. Moncad is a known admirer of his, um, and has scouted him before before he went to Ajax. Um, so yeah, there, there, there are options. There are plenty of options. Like this is a good summer, I think, to be going into with a really good financial position. Um. Obvious needs in the squad to address, i.e. a centre-forward and probably a centre-back, and also potentially to change head coach if we chose to do that. Like I think there's an abundance of everything available mm -hmm. rather than last season where we were like, well, we don't want to spend X amount on bringing Lukaku in and who knows right. how he holds up. And Well, the, the last season we just we needed <clears throat> so many positions. I, I get what you're saying about needing you know centre-back, centre-forward, and... Um, the others as well, but we're not in the position we were last summer. Last summer we were thin and then we sold players. So it was like, we really need to get in 10 bodies or whatever it is. And and I think we probably did the best job we could have with the situation and the, the money we had. But mm -hmm. this year, I mean, we got to spend a bit bigger and get some higher quality players because now we're just reinforcing the, the team's good. You know, I, I don't think this team is bad by any means. There's a few weak links here and there, but for the most part, it, it's good. And we're, you're just replacing the guys who are aging themselves out, be it Care, Giroud. And that's, I mean, those are the, the two big ones. Maybe. Right? Yeah, Florenzi as well. But even then, like, I don't, yeah, we probably need a fullback because, yeah, Florenzi plays a lot more than he should. As a backup, yeah. he plays a lot. Yeah, um, yeah, it's more fine tuning in it than overhauling. Like the the sale of mm -hmm. Tonali sort of left us needing to rebuild that entire department, and I think we've done a pretty good job with it, to be honest. But there are still some some when you look at like a, a depth chart of the squad, there are certainly a couple of positions that we need to address. But I think you can devote more money to those positions rather than last summer where we made that sale and we knew we were going to be bringing in players mostly for like 15 20 mil and and trying yeah. to trying to find good value that way um speaking of a gap in the squad Hevanley asks are we linked with any real register for next season if not where does it rank in your priority list i don't know if we are um couple it's there, not there was up a on my priority list to be honest it, it was last summer but somehow this seems finding a way to to make it work in the formation without one um, if we get one, it'd be great. But for me, it's not a priority. I'm looking for the guy that gave me goals, the guy to stop putting them in, you know, replace Kier, replace Giroud, and honestly, I'm good. Yeah, I um, I, I put it third on the priority list between, behind a centre forward and a centre back. I think we've suffered at times this season from not having a more defensively minded midfielder. It's not about having people say someone like a Kessie or someone like a Tonali who's going to battle, scrap, protect the defense, stuff like that. I just think sometimes we are lacking a calm and composed head on the ball who can who can distribute it effectively. He's quite tidy in possession. I mean, one of the names that has been mentioned mainly because of his agent saying that we're a potential destination is like Jorginho. 
And we've got quite a young midfield. So if you throw someone in like him, who has won basically everything there is to win, is a natural number six. Um, then has he? Yeah, me. I oh, see he did win the Champions League, Chelsea, huh? Mm. Yeah, and uh, Italy, obviously the Euros, and well, no World Cup, but uh, but yeah, like he he's been around the block a bit basically. Yeah. So you could bring someone like him in for two or three years. Um, I'm not saying I'd do that, but that's one of the things that has been mentioned. Or you could go for a younger profile like Ricky at um, at Torino or. Wallace was linked at Udinese over the weekend. I've always quite liked him. I feel like he's been there for a long, long time now. I think he's 28, so he's probably just pushing on a, a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, th- there are definitely options who you could bring in to, uh, to to bolster that position. It just depends. Firstly, who's the head coach? You know, what, mm-hmm. what kind of a, a system are they going to want to play? Um, and secondly, if it is purely, is he going to keep going with this? Like, the way to dominate games is to attack and we just want midfielders who are going to play on the front foot and stuff like that. I personally don't think that it's sustainable to do that in the, the games at the highest level. You know, I think our Champions League group stage exit, the games against Inter have kind of shown that you do need someone who is is able to to shield the defence a little bit. But uh, yeah, right, we'll do one more. Hassan Abujeri, Jerzy, sorry, asks, in, prior, in terms of priority of sales... Everyone's talking about Teo, Mignan and Liao. I see Tamari, Benacer and Reinders as just as important. And there have been rumours of interest from Man United and Arsenal. I wouldn't sell any of these three players unless we are making Tenali-like money. Do you agree? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sell any of the players either. Uh, if we're getting Tenali money for Benacer, I-, I would take it. Um, how much should we spend to bring in Reinders? I don't think I would get rid of him just yet. Uh, 20 yeah, I would hold on to him, um, even if they offered us 60, you know, um, mm-hmm. which would be tripling the money. That, that would be huge on a one-year return, but I, I don't think it's worth rebuilding the midfield again. So I, no. I would hold on to them. I think a lot of people are in this mindset that that next summer is going to look exactly like last summer, and I just don't think that's true. Um, I think we did what we had to do last year, and, and now you build on that, and I, I don't see any big exits this summer, actually. No, I, 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 I'm I, thinking along the same lines. I don't think we're in a position where we need to sell a big player. That doesn't mean that every player doesn't have a price, you know. Um, it will be internally discussed more than you'd think how much our best players are worth and how mm. much we'd sit at the negotiating table for. Tonali, as much as it hurt because of the sentimental aspect attached to it, I think, first of all, the Tonali thing showed us that, you know, we are willing to sell anybody who we get an offer for that's way above their market value. Um, and I think it also shows that like there's a thing for cashing in when a player's stock is so high. So for example, we're coming up to this summer and everyone, I, I think the general consensus is that Mignan is the most replaceable uh, of the of the players that keeps being linked with the next season. He's 28, keeps picking up injuries. He's on a bit of a down year, but all of that then means that his value is impacted as a result. So this summer might not actually be the summer to cash in on him, you know? Mm-hmm. Maybe last summer might have been better when he'd had such a good season. And But you can never predict uh, a drop-off, can you, really? You, you always hope that those players continue at that level. Uh, I think Teo's the most difficult to replace along with Liao. Um, but I think... Oh, no, you, you mentioned Tamari. I think Tamari, we're losing him, would be massive. Um, you don't want to lose a midfielder again. Like you said, you don't want to have to rebuild that department. The, why don't we just keep them all and <laughs> build around the core? We don't need to sell. Um, just, I, I do think that other teams in the league, I'm looking at Inter and their financial situation, I'm looking at Juve and some potential unrest there, they're going to have to sell big players or big players are going to want to leave, hopefully. So that will destabilise them a bit. Our plus point could be that we we have some stability. Everyone wants to be here. You know, that's what publicly the, the best players are saying is how much they love it. So let's use that to our advantage fine-tune the squad, and, and hopefully we have a, a good run next season. Wrap it up there. Um, I've been your host, Ollie Fisher. Find me on Twitter, at Ollie Fisher. AJ, cheers for joining. Yep, sorry I yawned so much, guys. I didn't have coffee today, and it's uh, it's not even 7 in the morning yet, so uh, I'm still sleepy, but yep, always here. Never doubt the dedication. Uh, thank you to everybody for listening during this international break. Of course, next week we'll be back with some game action to talk about. 
Uh, and until then, take care. Goal! Ancora Teo! È una meraviglia! Il gol di Teo Hernandez! Da un'area all'altra! È una meraviglia! Senti il mio cuore!